Chuck Linick, a marine actor. And for 36 years in the classroom, I use living history to lure my students into discovering how cool history is. And the way I did it is I showed up in garb, which was always good for freaking out the kids and freaking out a number of adults. I would immerse them in the culture by playing the music in the background for whatever time period we were studying, or whatever culture we were studying. So it was kind of like an out playing situation. I would bring in stuff for the kids to handle. And, um, you know, you could say those were artifacts, even though they were replicas. Or you could say that those were realia or manipulatives. If you want to use fancy teacher talk when they have to fill out documentation when they talk to administrators. Well, I'm not in the classroom anymore. But I have this room at the house that's filled to capacity with garb. Because I also do other historical reenactment. I have this passion for bringing the past to life. That's still there. I have a desire to play history detective, an amateur archaeologist, amateur anthropologist. And I have a desire to preserve landmarks because they go away. And I'm someone who believes that it can the complete story needs to be told of these different places. So what I'm doing right now is I'm in this very pretentious sounding mission odyssey where I am traveling all over California, I'm just running up and down the state, visiting each of the missions in garb to tell the story of each mission, but it's also going further. I've got to cover the Asistencias, those are the spin-off missions. I've got to cover the Estancias, or as many as I can find that haven't been bulldozed and had housing tracks put on them. And I have to also cover the Presidios, and those are the fortifications designed to protect the missions. Well, what I'm doing today is I'm on my way to Mission San Juan Bautista. I've just left Mission Carmel, or Mission San Carlos, and I hope you stick with me on my journey. In 1790, the Spanish began to show considerable interest in the lands to the east of El Camino Real, reflected in San Jose, San Juan Bautista, and Soledad. The unfriendly Indians were no longer avoided, but were fought, and as supply bases, San Jose and San Juan Batista were constantly visited by groups of soldiers. Fighting was not the only method of approaching the pagans, for among Franciscans, the idea of establishing other missions to the east was never discarded. Thirteen missions had already been established in Alta California, but the distance between some of them was still more than the singles day journey people are fond of quoting. During the summer of 1797, Padre Lasuen, president of the California missions, set out to fill in some of those gaps. He embarked on the highly ambitious and highly successful plan to establish four missions that summer. And it was a busy summer for him. On June 11th, the 14th mission, San Jose, was founded, followed by San Juan Bautista as the 15th on June 24th, Mission San Miguel Archangel, on July 25th of 1797 and the 17th on September 8th, San Fernando Rey de España. In the spring of 1797, Corporal Juan Ballesteros and five soldados de Cuera arrived here and they were the advance party to help establish Mission San Juan Batista. In that uh, spring they built the chapel, a granary uh, quarters for the Padres and themselves. Of course they built it right next to the San Andreas Fault. Um, 
June 24th, 1797, Mission San Juan Batista, named for John the Baptist, was established here by Padre Lasuen. The founding missionaries to guide the new mission were Padres Pedro Martinez and Jose Marti Arena. Within two weeks, the first baptism took place. Corporal Ballesteros was the sponsor. Later, a son of the corporal was the first white baptism at the mission. And by September, the first funeral took place at the mission, an infant son of the corporal. So the mission was established near the rancheria or village of Popilochum, which belonged to the Mutsum. And these were uh, people that were a tribalet of the Yolani. And initially, the uh, Mutsum were friendly with the Spanish coming in and helped them build the mission. And by Christmas, under the supervision of um, the second carpenter of the frigate Concepcion, Ignacio Barrera, an adobe chapel was built as well as a granary and an, a number of other buildings. So even though the Mutsunes or Ohlone were fairly friendly in the area of Mission uh, San Juan Bautista, and they helped establish, they helped build a number of the structures fairly quickly. Um, there were still people that were not happy at all. Uh, there was a group called the Ansayames who lived in the mountains about 25 miles away. And in 1798, they attacked the mission at night. They were chased off. And of course, there was a punitive uh, expedition by the soldados who ended up uh, killing several and they captured a couple of chieftains and they also captured a couple of others and brought them back to be forcibly educated. And that was the phrase that I read which was really chilling. That still didn't stop the attacks. There were others that ended up occurring and uh, some of the San Juaneños, that's what the neophytes were being called, uh, were killed by the Anseames. And there was a bit of give and take as far as, you know, attacking each other for a bit. Unfortunately, this was built in the center of the San Juan Valley and the San Andreas Fault is right there. So there were instances of enough earthquakes happening that the Padres and the neophytes were going to end up sleeping outside in order to deal with you know, the fear of earthquakes because they would be seeing cracks appearing in the buildings, cracks appearing in the ground. And this made for some uncomfortable times. So when the earthquake of 1800 finally knocked down the uh, Adobe Chapel, a new one was being constructed. In 1803, extensive plans were made for the building of a new church. The construction work was preceded by an elaborate ceremony in June in which people from all over the province were invited. During the dedication, a story of the event was sealed in a bottle and placed within the cornerstone. From 1803 to 1812, the resident Indians, whose population had been growing, labored at construction of the quadrangle complex, which included a roughly 190-foot-long church and a beautiful corridor of 20 arches along the convento, all constructed of fired adobe brick. The mission church is said to be the largest of the missions, and would hold 1,000 people during the mission days. So even though the new chapel for Mission San Juan Bautista is being built, Spanish eyes are already looking to the east. Uh, there was uh, an expedition that was supposed to last two years that was being led by Gabriel Moraga, who was already a big deal. He had uh, served as the military representative in the Pueblo 
of San Jose and later had that same post at the uh, Pueblo Branceforte. Well, now he's been given charge of this expedition and he went into Yokut territory and was exploring there. And on January 6th, 1806, he camped beside a river he named El Rio de los Santos Reyes because he was camping there on Epiphany. And Padre Pedro Munoz, who was with the expedition, noted how wonderful the site was and was very excited about it. And they, there was even a suggestion of having a mission established there. And it would be called the mission of the three holy kings. And what ended up happening is they also decided there would need to be a presidio there. So like a number of the Spanish plans, this one didn't come to fruition. Even though that mission was never established along the King's River in Yoku's territory, because of the proximity of the mission to like, I guess there was a crossing of El Camino Real and El Camino Viejo, the old road, Yokut started to appear at the mission and they ended up joining the population which was probably just in time to do construction on the new chapel. So what are these neophytes going to do that are either arriving at the mission voluntarily or being dragged back? Well, in the quad or the quadrangle of each of the missions there would be a number of workshops and these neophytes would be taught skills that would make them useful valuable citizens in the Spanish and now Mexican world so leather working and uh, carpentry and candle making and soap making in addition to those skills that are going to be used on the various estancias and stations that the uh, mission would have, such as, you know, raising cattle and, you know, raising horses and raising sheep. Because remember, this is about missions being productive. In 1808, while the new chapel and quadrangle were being built, Padre Felipe del Arroyo de la Cuesta arrived at the mission. And he brought with him a tremendous energy, learning, and imagination. Instead of the usual long and narrow mission church with a single nave or center aisle, Padre de la Cuesta convinced the builders to build a wide church with three naves. It would be an unusual asset to San Juan and would hold the growing population of the faithful. With the new vision before them, the Indian laborers, whose numbers were actually declining, continued their work for the next four years, making the idea of Padre de la Cuesta a reality. When it was completed, the three-foot-thick adobe walls enclosed a structure 188 feet long, 72 feet wide, and with its three naves, made it the largest in the province, capable of being able to hold a thousand churchgoers, the only structure of its kind ever built by the Franciscans in Alta California. It was dedicated on June 23rd, 1812 and replaced the much smaller adobe chapel built by Ignacio Barrera. As usual, too much stuff. As usual, didn't fit into one video. So I have to come back here. And I hope you stick with me.